Thanks for inviting me um, to give this talk. I don't often talk to groups of imaging people, and um, to some extent, um, I do feel a little bit like the sacrificial lamb of function walking into the lion's den of um, structure. Um, but I'm hoping it will lead to some really interesting conversations, you know, and discussions and questions at the end of this, which you go into. Now, it's important, first of all, I have to declare an interest for those that didn't know I have an interest in the Henson perimeter. Um, <laughs> And I also um, currently work for um, Electron Eye Technology, so I have a part-time job as a consultant for Electron Eye Technology, of course, make the Henson perimeter. So let me kick straight off so as we can um, get through and leave plenty of time for questions. I'm going to be talking about structure and, uh, and function and just, just really a very basic recap for those that are not familiar with what we're talking about here. Uh, what we're talking about really is the structure of the eye as is measured with the optic nerve head parameters that you've seen for many years looking at CD ratios and neuroretinal rim areas and this, that and the other and also circumpillary uh, retinal nerve fiber layer measurements which we've heard from the earlier talks and also the thickness of the RGC and uh, IPL etc at the macula. So we have a, a whole series of structural measures that we've now got um, but we also have a number of functional measures which Leading the field is obviously visual fields, but then there are other functional measures such as visual acuity, color vision, and of course ERGs and VRs, although they have a, a relatively minor role in the routine testing of people with glaucoma. So what I'm going to be talking about is the relationship between these two. And by relationship, what I'm saying is, does one occur before the other? Do they occur simultaneously? And when there are disparities between the two, can these be explained as it, by some sort of understanding of the processes involved in the development of the disease? Okay, I want to start off because to fully understand this, I need to, I need to talk a little bit about bias. And bias occurs inevitably in almost everything we do. I mean, I'm biased, I'm going to talk about fields. Others of you are very biased, want to think something else, etc. So the bias is everywhere. And what I really liked was this one paper that was published in 1990 in a quite prestigious journal, I, which is the British Ophthalmology Journal. I've left out the name of the author because I didn't want to embarrass him. Okay? But he was talking about the sensitivity and specificity or discriminatory power of non-cat contact tonometry when it's done by technicians. Okay? The results were that it's 91.7% sensitive and 95.6% specific. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but this seems a long way out from what the rest of us are talking about. We tend to think of non-contact anomaly being maybe 50% sensitive because it misses all the normal tensive glaucomas and also not being very specific because it would falsely refer all the ocular hypertensives. So why did we get this sort of very different answer to what we know from many other papers. Well, it's simply that in selecting the cases that were the glaucoma cases, a criterion was that they had high intraocular pressure. And what happens is if you select a population that has high intraocular pressure, a tonometer is going to be a very good technique of differentiating between high pressure and not high pressure glaucoma. So this is an example of really rampant selection bias, where we're getting completely the wrong answer because we've selected the population that came into our study. To avoid bias, the simple rule is that you do not include in your selection process the thing that you're measuring. So if you're going to look at the value of non-contact tonometry, you don't include tonometry in your selection criteria. You have to select your cases maybe on the basis of structural changes and functional changes. Okay? So that's a very easy example. Okay? But let's go on a bit further. Supposing you want to do an imaging study, then really if you want to look at the sensitivity and specificity of an imaging study, you shouldn't select the patients on the basis of structure. Okay? You should select them on the basis of visual fields and interocular pressure. Because otherwise, you're going to bias your results. If a criteria is having an imaging defect, then you're going to find imaging is very good at detecting the cases. You've got to exclude it. And similarly, 
if you're going to look at the sensitivity and specificity of fields, then really you shouldn't select your patients on the basis of visual field loss. Does that make sense? Well, that's easy. But how about if you want to compare visual fields and OCT? Because now your study is involving both structure and function. How do you select your patients? Well, you can select them on the basis of IOP, and that's one way, but this would exclude all the normal intensive cases, so that doesn't sound like a very good idea. Okay? Is there some other way where we can avoid bias but also do a comparative study between two techniques? We could use clinical experts, okay? and we heard that in the previous uh, talk by Don Hood. You're basically, you're going to use a couple of experts who are going to give all, all the information you like and hopefully that they're not biased. Um, I've never met a non-biased expert and it was interesting that uh, Michael Lewis, who is the author of the big short uh, paper, um, book that was also a film, some of you must have seen. Anyway, he's learned one thing, experts always get it wrong. So there is a real quandary here because we are effectively almost always going to be biased when we do a study comparing um, visual fields and OCT. You can avoid bias, right? You can do it by basically doing a population study where you just get everybody or people that are, might be at risk of glaucoma, maybe they've got a family history of glaucoma, which puts them at much greater risk, or they have, say, high IOP, and you study them over a long period of time until they develop definitive glaucoma, either structure and function loss, then you go back through the re earlier records and see which one occurred first, etc. Okay. Um, the problem with that is it would be a very large sample you'd need because most people wouldn't convert and it would take a very long time to get the answer. So it's generally not done on the basis of time and cost involved in the study. There is another way you could do it and that's you could do an animal study. Okay. You could take some primates and you could basically induce glaucoma in those eyes, of the, one eye of the primate, and then you could watch the glaucoma develop in that eye and then you could sacrifice the eye and examine the retina, count the number of ganglion cells in different parts of the retina and look at their visual field responses. And you're thinking, well, you're going to look at their visual fields? Well, this has been done. And the research has shown that monkeys are actually very good at doing Humphrey visual fields. <laughs> in fact, the person that trains them said they're slightly better than a lot of patients. So Ron Harworth, who's done this many times, has written many papers on the subject, has basically shown here, and here are two examples, and we show this is basically a primate prior to having their interocular raised in one eye, and then later on, one month after developing glaucoma. And you can see the onset of the visual field defect in this point here, and you can also see he was doing OCT changes in the OCT. So if you look at his results, what does Ron Harworth say about the development of structural and functional loss? Well, it's quite simply, he says, they occur in a linear way and they occur together. Okay? So the answer is, which occurs first? They occur together. Now, you're going to say to me, well, hold on. Why do we keep finding these cases where there is large amounts of or apparently large amounts of functional loss and no structural loss, as the one on the left is showing. And similarly, if we look on the right, there's apparently large amounts of structural loss, but no functional loss. And we all see these, and they're regularly reported because they're of interest. How can we square that up with what we're getting from people like Ron Harworth and his primate studies? Well, the current explanation for this is it's all to do with variability in the measurement that you're taking. Um, and I'll give an example here, and I apologise for giving this example because it's not a very good one, but I think it makes the point. Okay? Um, and what I've got here is basically the, uh, a, 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 an average thickness of the nerve fibre layer around the disc. And basically, we're looking at a group of patients of different age, and we can see that the thickness varies a lot within the individuals. And we can also see that it actually gets a little bit thinner as we, as we progress into the 70 category, which I'm a bit worried about, but never mind. Um, so we see here we have a, 
a patient with a particularly thick nerve fibre layer, and we have one down here with a particularly thin nerve fibre layer. And if we were to put the 95% confidence limits on that, we could easily see that this person hardly has to lose any nerve fibres and they're abnormal. Whereas if you look at this one here, they would have to lose a massive number of nerve fibres before they get to that point where you deem them as outside normal limits. So this is a, a sort of an explanation, is it's this variability that exists in almost every measurement we take will influence which measure basically picks up the condition first. So it might be a functional measure because of the structure is a little bit different in the eye, or it might be a structural measure because the structure is very sensitive in this particular case. If we look at thresholds measured with um, perimetry, then this work by Mike Wall has shown that if you repeat the threshold measurement, you don't always get the same answer. So what we're doing is, is 24-2 Humphrey measurements, and we're looking at threshold measurements, and we're repeating them and looking at the second value. So what we're saying is if we, if we find a patient whose first threshold is 10 BB, so this is damaged location, when we test them a second time, their threshold at that location could be anywhere between 0 and 23. I mean, that is a massive amount of variability in the visual field measure. If we take another example, say one here where the threshold is about 20 dB, if we measure them again, they could be anywhere between 4 and 28 dB. These are the 95% confidence. You could be 95% confident that they haven't changed if they're between 4 and 28. Well, that's not very helpful. So visual fields has a problem in that when you get to this area where there's damage in the visual field, there is a very large amount of variability. At this end, at the normal area, the variability is much more manageable. Small changes become significant. So how can you reduce variability, in not only in fields, but also in OCT measurements, etc.? Well, you can repeat the measures. If you take an average of several measures, the variability will reduce dramatically. Okay? So that's one thing you do, just repeat them. And remember that, because I'm going to come back to that later on. Okay? You can include more factors. Okay? So in the example here, you could use macular and optic nerve head OCT rather than just macular or optic nerve head. And you combine the two, then you get more information, and basically you're more likely to detect the defects if one exists in either location in isolation. You can combine MD and PSD, and this is the glaucoma staging system of Paolo Brusini, and basically what he's saying is that here's CPD, PSD along here, look, and here's MD along here. You can go from a normal field to a highly damaged field by changing just PSD. I'm shaking a lot here, what's this? Hold on. Uh, or you can go on the MD route. And most people go down the middle, as it were, but the idea is if you combine the two, then you're going to be better at detecting change or early loss than if you just use one measure. Um, you can use less variable indices. Okay, so you could say, well, let's look for an index that doesn't vary quite so much as the one I chose here. Um, you can compensate for confounding factors. I, instead of just looking at the thickness, you include a parameter for age, because that would reduce that variable, the age variable in there, and that would improve things. Um, you can look at right-left asymmetries, or superior-inferior differences, and we do this in visual fields. We look at superior-inferior differences with the glaucoma hemifield test, and I will show you more data later on, that you can also look at right-left differences, which greatly enhance your ability to detect defects like glaucomatous ones. Alternatively, you can look for change okay, over time. That would be even better because then you've got a control. The control, as it were, is the patient themselves rather than a population of normal people. Now, we've seen all these pictures before, um, and I've just put some dates and times here. There, there has been just absolutely amazing improvements in, in OCT technology, you know, going back to... 1995, when we saw the first um, 1,000 um, OCT machines onto 
Fourier de Marine in 2007, and then SDOCT and also SWEPS also CT images that we're, we're now getting. I mean, there have been absolute tremendous developments in this technology um, over the last 30, 40 years. This development in OCT has led a lot of people to say, well, OCTs are faster. They're much more patient-friendly. Okay, patients like OCTs. They're impressed by them. They're not so impressed with doing field tests. Okay. Um, there are studies reporting cases where there's structural but no functional loss, which might bias us as well a little bit. And then I've got a little quote from Don Hood himself saying, when using a one-page report, the experienced readers show excellent inter rate of repeatability, diagnostic ability. So you might say, well, do we need to do visual field tests, okay, given this improvement in OCT technology? Practically every study that has looked at OCT and compared it to visual fields, etc., has used the CETA 24-2 perimetry. Okay? So Basically, the 24-2 pattern was actually introduced in the octopus in 1977. Okay. Um, and it's widely used and widely promoted in the Humphrey Field Analyzer. It's just a square matrix of points, 54 points, with a six-degree separation between the test points. It's known as a, as a general test. I, it, was, it was devised back in 1977 for situations where you didn't really know what you're looking for. And it certainly wasn't designed as a test for glaucoma. Okay? Although, because it is so widely used, we still continue to use it. The CETA algorithm was developed in 1987 for the Humphrey Field Analyzer. Okay? And it was designed to reduce test times, which are for a normal person down to about five minutes and a little bit longer if the patient has glaucoma. And this is the data down here. If we look at 50 subjects who are normal and we look at CETA versus the previous full threshold technique, we can see the number of presentations for a visual field test drops by about 100. Instead of about 450 presentations, we're down to a mere 350, okay? which you might think is a lot. I do. Okay? If you look at the glaucoma cases, then they're higher. The more presentations, maybe about 500 dropping down to just under 400 presentations. If we go back to our timeline then, and we look at the development of technologies, we can see we have 24-2 developed about 1977, CETA, 1986, time domain, about 1996, Fourier domain, 2007, SWEP source, about 2013, and one-page reports, about 2016. So when we do comparison studies, we're comparing this with this. There's 30 year difference between these technologies. And is this a very fair comparison? Okay. Why are we using field techniques that were over 30 years old against OCT techniques that are absolutely brand new? Has there been actually no developments in perimetry since 1986? And that's the question I want to answer by the following slides. Well, there are two important issues in the field test that we can look at and say what developments have occurred. One is the number and position of the test points, and the other one is the response characteristics of damaged locations. So let's just kick off looking at the test points. We've already mentioned this. We're doing the 24-2 pattern. Okay. It's been known, as I said earlier, since the late 70s, that this test pattern is less than ideal for glaucoma. So it's not new that, there is a, that it's wrong. In fact, if we look carefully here, this is the G pattern for the octopus, which came out in 1987 and shows much more stimuli in the central part of the field. So the G pattern was developed specifically to screen and test for glaucoma and monitor it. Whereas the, remember what I said, this was just a general pattern for any old disease, any old field test. And we know that this pattern undersamples the central area and have known for many years. And of course, it was highlighted in Don Hood's talk that basically when you look at people with macular damage here, there's hardly any stimuli that fall within the, or any 24-2 stimuli 
that fall within areas that often are damaged in early glaucoma. What's the solution? Well, we could just use different patterns. We could use the G program from Humphrey and more points in the center of the field. We could use radial patterns, which have been available on lots of perimeters for many, many years. Okay. Um, the problem with both these approaches is they're not compatible with our existing data. Now, why should that be important? Well, we have historical records going back many, many years of patients with 24-2 tests. And it would be very useful if we retained those 24-2 points so as we could compare and see progression over time. The solution is maybe we should add 10-2 points to the 24-2. But as you all know, this takes a long time to do two tests on each patient. It will double the test times. You'll be talking about 10 minutes per eye, and that is far too long. In fact, um, with a previous um, a student, an MSc student, um, we did some monitoring, monitoring vigilance with um, perimetry using a pupillometer. And for those who've done perimetry and you've sat there watching the person do the test, if you watch them very carefully, watch their pupil, what you'll find after about three or four minutes, the pupil constricts. Okay? And that means you're losing them. They're losing attention. Okay? And we, we demonstrate this very clearly. Okay? They often actually show also an oscillation that, that occurs in it. And that is they have really lost it, okay? Which means they're just... So you, you kick the perimeter, they wake up, pupil dilates, and you carry on testing them for a bit longer. But there's a limit to how far you can do this. If you're going to go for 10 minutes, that's really too long. You have to break it down. And within a National Health Service, I can tell you, it's really difficult to do both 24-2 and 10-2 perimetry on all glaucoma patients. So, yes, it solves the problem, but it just creates another problem of being able to do it. You could add a few extra 24-2 test points, but that I don't think is a really a worthwhile. I'll come back to the patterns of stimuli later on. Okay? So I'm leaving you two things now, one repeat and patterns of stimuli. I want to talk about response characteristics of the eye. So what I have here is a, is a simple ogive. Okay? And it's saying that if you present a very bright light, someone's going to see it 100% of the time. And if you present them with a very, very dim light, they're not going to see it at all. And if you go from dim to bright, you get this S-shaped curve, which we call a frequency of seeing curve. I, at this point, about 34, 30, you start to see the occasional stimulus if you present them over and over again. And then you get better and better as you get brighter and brighter until you start to see them all. So... When we look at this, the threshold is normally taken as the midpoint, the 50% seeing, which in this case is about 32 dB. And we can then add the 90% confidence limits, which lie between 28 and 34 dB, a little bit on either side. So the variability, this is the 5%, this is the 95%, so 90% of people will fall within this range. If we now look at a damaged point in the visual field, okay, what happens is the slope flattens. So here we have somebody whose basic threshold is 20 dB now. The slope is flatter. The 95% confidence limits now have gone way up to over 10 decibels. So this is just a, a recap to some extent of that test retest, only this one is done in a much more scientifically rigorous way. Okay. If we look at some very recent papers, and, and what I want to say is that these, these frequency of seeing curves uh, in perimetry and in patients were kicked off by Bao Chauhan in about 1993, and then there was a much better paper after that in 2000, okay, that looked at them in more detail and basically told you how these slopes fatten in them. But then this, these data here is actually from Stuart Gardner, who in 2014 did an even better ex experiment. And what he's showing is these lovely, nice ogives here, nice and reliable when they're up at the 30 dB range. But when you drop down to damaged locations, he couldn't even plot an ogive in all of these patients. They never saw 100%, even when you put it at the brightest intensity. 
So the concept that you can actually measure a threshold in these patients was being questioned by Stuart Gardner, and he really said there is absolutely no point in trying to measure a threshold below certain values. You're wasting your time. And here's this graph again. Remember, this is this Mike Wall data basically showing the repeatability. And what Stuart Gardner is saying is you really shouldn't test below about 20 decibels because you're not going to get reliable data. Now, I said that the way to improve tests is actually to make them more reliable, to get less variability in the test. So to some extent, when we know this about fields and have known this since the 93 and certainly since 2000 and later on, why do we keep testing in these areas? Because all that's going to do is add variability and make the test more variable and the results more variable. So logically, if you know this is a highly variable region, you shouldn't be testing it when you're trying to monitor and detect glaucoma's damage. You should concentrate your measurements up in the top end. Now, one thing you can do also is look at asymmetry between the two eyes or between the two hemifields because if we can do an asymmetry analysis, we obviously overcome the, the variation within the population. So asymmetry between the two hemifields, which is like the glaucoma hemifield test, basically, looking at the difference between the upper and lower hemifield, generally produces a much more reliable, more sensitive and specific result than looking at um, just a single eye. So Aspen basically said this, again, over, well, over 30 years ago in 1992, saying when they developed the hemifield test for the Humphrey. Um, Nakiba, and, uh, who was another PhD student of mine, basically extended this, and we were able to, instead of just use outside normal limits, inside normal limits, we were able to do a, 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 a basically a probability map of whether it was normal or abnormal, and we were able to extend it to looking between the right and left eyes. So what we would do is we'd look at a population of patients and say, this point in the visual field corresponds to this point in the other eye, basically, what is the difference in a normal population and how does it vary? And when the difference is greater than that amount, we'll say they're outside the normal limits. Okay? We do that for all 54 points and we get excellent discrimination because glaucoma invariably kicks off in one eye before the other. So as soon as you know that, as soon as you compare to the other eye, which clinicians do all the time, don't you? You basically, you take both eyes and you look at the two eyes and you say, oh, perfect field here few dodgy points here. Well, if it was dodgy and dodgy, you'd think, bad patient. Good and dodgy, bad eye. Okay. So there are ways in which we could improve our analysis of data by looking more at this between eyes and between hemifields data. So if we take the standard visual field chart, this is, basic, this is a Humphrey field chart, obviously, here. And if we look at this carefully, then what we see is that in this particular eye, there's a large area of loss here. Okay? And if I add some numbers here, all of these points are in the highly variable area of the visual of the, of the spectrum. They're down at bottom end, below 20 dB, and the results are likely to change dramatically from one session to another. Okay? So is this the way to go forward, or should we be thinking of something else? And it was really nice to hear Don Wood talk about the use of probability maps rather than absolute values. Are these points outside normal limits at the 95 or 98 or 99 percent? Isn't that a much more sensible thing to look at rather than to look at these numbers that vary dramatically from one minute to the next? And that exists within the standard printout. These, these are the total deviation and pattern deviation probability maps that exist at the bottom, if we can go back, I can't go back, oh, I can go back, that exist down here at the bottom of the chart. In my view, this is the most useful information on the chart. It tells you where the defect occurs, and it tells you whether the defect is significant. This up here is more misleading. If we go back to this thing here, these, the 98 95, 98, 99% probability limits, probability limits 
exist within this small region of the range of threshold measurements. I.e. they're concentrated in the higher reliability area of the, of the of this spectrum, as it were. Now, if we do a super threshold test, what we classically do is set the test such that it's a fixed increment above the threshold across the whole field. So this is what we call gradient adapted, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Okay. Um, could we improve on this? Could we make some, could we be a little smarter than this? Why don't we change it such that we actually set it at the 95, 98, 99% confidence limits? Because what we know is that the variability close to the fovea is much smaller than the variability out at 24 degrees. And therefore, we should be using a smaller increment at the 99 95, 98, etc. level there, than out here. Okay. So one development in perimetry we could do is actually move into using probability measures in order to set a super threshold value rather than fixed increments. This is exactly that. Okay. This is a new version of the Henson that's coming out next month, I'm told, okay, that's called Smart Supra. What it does is it basically tests at the 95, 98, and 99% limits and then produces a probability map for the eye, the right eye, and the left eye. And the probability map will depend, the type, whether it's total deviation or pattern deviation, will depend on the type of super threshold test you did. If you set the threshold according to the age, you get a total deviation map. And if you have a threshold setting at the beginning, you'd have a pattern deviation probability map. So now from a super threshold test, you'll be getting the most useful output from a threshold test in much less time. Remember, that basically is the same as these plots here. So, points to remember, if you use probability maps, you will increase the sensitivity of super threshold tests, particularly in the foveal macular area, because you'll be closer to the threshold and you're basically rather than so high. You'll reduce the variability because you will now be avoiding testing at those locations where variability is very high. Okay. If you do it on 9,000, then you could include a 24 and 10-2 test in a single test, okay? So you can start with, as I think you're all familiar, okay? You could start with a earlier test. You'll see this in the late slide, okay? So you'll have improved sensitivity to early defects shown here, okay? You use probability increments to improve the sensitivity, avoid testing below, and provide total. I've said that already. Okay, let's move on. The other thing to remember is patients much prefer super threshold tests to threshold tests, okay? So you'll keep your patients happy. The super threshold tests, as I said, are much faster, okay? So you can test more points in the same amount of time. Okay? So as if you were doing a Henson, typical Henson, if you wanted to just screen the eye, you could still use 26 points and do it in approximately a minute. And all the locations here now are optimized to detecting glaucomatous loss. We'd published this um, not so long ago, saying these are in fact 24-2 points, but each one of these points falls in an area that is most likely to be damaged in early glaucoma. Importantly, some of the most important ones are these two point, or these four points out in this area here. You can then extend the test and do a full 24-2, all the points. This will take you about two minutes per eye. And you extend it further, do a 10-2 as well, and basically take three minutes, just under three minutes. So actually, as far as my patient falling asleep with his pupil at three minutes, you'll just about get him out of the chair before his pupil goes down. Okay, so this is the new test, smart super test. It's extendable from 26 to 24 and 24 and 10-2. 
It's multiple or single stimulus, whichever one you want. Okay? And very importantly, and this is why I said it's important, remember, if you want to improve quality, you repeat the measurement. Okay? This test will basically allow you to represent, add new test points or correct existing test points at any time during the test, beginning, during, end, or whatever. So you can always go back to a suspicious point, test it again, and say, are they still missing this point? In which case, then you can sort of readjust it or your opinion of what's wrong. I bet you're thinking that's the end, aren't you? I've got two additional very important points I want to mention. Okay? The first one is, do we really need to detect glaucoma earlier? The second one is, what level of specificity do we need in our tests? So let's kick off with, do we need to detect it earlier? This is a timeline of a glaucoma patient. So disease onset occurs here, right? It's undetectable at that stage. So as the disease progresses, you get to a point where you can detect it with OCT or visual fields or both. You then have a pre-symptomatic stage in which it's detectable, increasingly detectable. It comes symptomatic at a certain point and then advances further and you become visually impaired. So how long is this stage? And is it better to detect it here rather than detect it here? Well, this is some work done by uh, Manos, who's Mr. Samis, okay, as part of his PhD. Okay. What he was looking at was a series of patients, about 100 patients, with varying stages of loss right, that were monitored over time to establish what their rate of loss was. So if you take people who have no field loss, their rate of loss is really low, 0.01, so they're never going to go blind if they stay at that rate. If you look at borderline cases, again, the rate of loss is very slow. In fact, it would take them about 925 years to actually get to our visual um, impaired status, which we've classified as 20 dB and ND of 20 dB. If we look at people with early loss, like this, right, their rate was about 0 0.04 dB per year. So they would take 428 years to get to the 20 dB loss. And you can see here, it doesn't really get down below 100 years until you get to stage four, which is very advanced loss. So what I'm saying is in modern treatment techniques, actually picking them up at any of these stages Will allow, you, will allow the ophthalmologist to basically treat the eye and it is very unlikely that person will ever become visually impaired. Um, I've got a number with rapid rates down here of progression and they do increase, okay? Um, and they are the worrying ones. These are the patients who suddenly get the disease and then rapidly progress, okay? So they do exist, fortunately not very common. And I've got one other number down here, and that is if you look at our advanced cases at Manchester Eye Hospital, 72% of them had stage four at first presentation, and 95% of the ones that became impaired had stage five at first presentation. So what we're saying is it's late referral that is the cause of visual impairment, not capturing them super early. So the question I'm asking now, at what stage do we need to present, do we need to detect glaucoma in order to have a long-term good outcome for the patient? And you might conclude from this, and certainly I would, we don't need to really bust a gut, as it were, to try to detect it one year or two years early, earlier. Because if we're at the stage where the very first appearance of the condition, then it's going to take a long time and there's plenty of scope to treat them a little later on. However, and there is always a however, it's important to realise that, generally speaking, the techniques that are less variable will detect the condition earlier. So newer techniques that are better will pick it up earlier. What about specificity? This was the other point I want to mention. Okay? Specificity and sensitivity are linked for any given measure, and I think you know this already. And this is a classic graph showing a distribution in a normal population a distribution of disease population. 
And you can see if you set your cutoff criteria here, so as you capture all the people with a disease, or you get 94% of them, you also fail at 35% of the normals. So that would not be a good referral criteria to the local hospital. If you moved it to this point here, your sensitivity drops to about 80% and your false positive rate drops to 20%. Still not very good. If you set it out here, okay, then yes, you get a nice 97% specificity, but your sensitivity has gone right down to 50%. So how do you deal with this? How can you separate this two? Well, the important thing to remember is that I situation is when the two mounds are completely separate okay because if now this is, if this is your cutoff criteria you'll be 100% sensitive and 100% specific so if we can separate the two and this is really what happens when you get somebody with intermediate and advanced disease so if somebody's coming along with a stage 3 or stage 4 defect okay you have no trouble separating the, the normal from the glaucoma okay so advanced disease looks like this, but early disease, detecting it earlier, creates more and more overlap. So the earlier you go, the more overlap, the more difficult it is to choose between criteria, and the more difficult it is to actually get good criteria with high sensitivity and high specificity. So this is the other example, basically, not very sensitive and specific. when you test for early loss. So if we just put some numbers in here to give you an idea of the problem a bit better, if we go for a specificity of 95%, then that means your false referrals would be five out of every 100 patients. And if we assume you're trying to detect about 1%, so if we say people over 40, 2%, but half of them are being treated for glaucoma anyway, so you're trying to detect 1% of the ca of cases, assuming 50% are undetected, okay, you would, you would find one case of glaucoma, i.e. your ratio, not your ration, okay, would be five false positives for every true positive. If you bumped it up to 98%, it'd be a two to one. If you got to 99%, it'd be one to one, okay? And if you could get to 99.5%, you'd only have one false referral for every two true cases. So really, in optometry, in this country, we need to be at this end here. Okay? We need to be very high specificity in order to, to not flood the ophthalmologist with dozens and dozens of false positives. The point I'm trying to make, and, and I hope you'll all agree with this, you can't get this from a single test. You can't get this, if you look at setting an OCT criteria to 99% specificity, then you would fail to detect lots of conditions. If you try to do that visual field, the same. But if you put the two together, you can get to these levels of sensitivity and specificity. So my point here in specificity is that you can only reach acceptable levels of referral by choosing both, both instruments, because it's only by the combination that you get to these high levels. I've got one little comment about global indices. I mean, we use mean defect is widely used to tracking glaucoma, et cetera. Um, it tends to be oversensitive to overall losses like cataract. It's completely unrelated to quality of life. An issue that Manus and I keep coming across with these severe glaucoma cases where they've only got a small central field, okay? They may be only seeing four or five stimuli on a Humphrey plot. They come back and they're missing one less so instead of four or five, it's three or four. They are well aware of this change. And yet, when you look at it on an MD scale, it's completely insignificant. So we need a scale that is much better and much better matches the quality of life measurements that people have. We need one which is much more sensitive to those central points, parts of the field and doesn't get washed out with large number of peripheral field loss. And... MD is based upon a highly variable threshold measures. We want to get away from using those measures. We want to maybe move to an area measuring de per device rather than a depth measuring uh, 
index. So new ones, we need new ones to better represent quality of life and weighted towards the macula. And that's work that needs to be done. So I'm, I'm hoping really maybe there's some people here thinking, oh, I could do some work on that and think about it and come up with a solution. There's work to be done in fields. It's not a stagnant area at all. OK, so in summary, developments in OTD are exciting and leading to new ways of detecting and managing glaucoma. Developments in visual fields have largely been ignored for many, many years, despite the fact that papers have existed that have highlighted the issues, some of which are coming up to the front, forefront now, i.e. the need to include more points in the fovea region, or the macular region. Both technologies benefit from reducing variability in measures, and we need to start using and pushing forward techniques for fields that are less variable than the ones we've been historically using. And high specificity is the key to efficient screening detection. I'll just leave you with a picture of 9,000 and the machine outside. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>